grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. I know you can't read this, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. <clears throat> At the top of this sermon manuscript that I have uh, is a bracketed statement. And what it says. Now, this is going to be even funnier. What it says is ad lib at the top, <laughs> which the tech team is used to seeing not really at the very beginning of the sermon, but usually somewhere down here. And ad lib means pastor has an idea of what he's going to say, but he's not real sure how he's going to say it, so just pay close attention and know when the next slide comes up. The reason ad lib is at the top of this sermon is because until about 10 a.m. yesterday morning, I still wasn't really sure what I was going to preach or how I was going to say it. I knew the text I was preaching on. I knew what I wanted to say, but sometimes the most difficult part of a sermon is, is really the crux of the sermon, that center point in the sermon that, that kind of weaves all the way throughout, that basic central or critical point or feature. I didn't really have any idea of what that was going to be. And then at 10 o'clock a.m., I had a phone call. It was a scheduled phone call with a person I had never met before. Someone actually had called me to say, this person wants to talk with a pastor. They have some questions. Can you please call them? You never really know what you're going to get on the other end of the phone when you make that call. But after that phone call, I was convinced of what I needed to speak on this weekend. Because in that phone call, I was asked two questions that in slightly different ways I had already been asked and dealt with two previous times this week before Saturday. So as thick-headed as I am, I took that as a hint that I should probably talk about that this weekend. The two questions that I was asked was, number one, how can God hear everyone's prayers all the time? And the second question, how can God forgive me when I can't forgive myself? I feel too far gone. After that conversation, I thought a lot in the afternoon before I had to preach at 5 o'clock last night how I was going to communicate this, and here's what I came up with. Most of the questions we have about God, most of the wrestlings we have with God, I think can begin to be resolved quite simply, by asking ourselves two very basic questions and answering those two questions as honestly as we can. And those two questions are number one, who am I? Who am I? And I think the more you ask that question to yourself and honestly answer it, it stops being a question and more of a statement about who I'm not which kind of then leads you to the second question that you should ask. Who is God? Who God is? Those two questions are really the crux, the center point of really starting to unravel the difficult parts of knowing God, having a relationship with Him, even starting to see how his grace and mercy works in our life. Who am I? Who is God? Who I'm not? Who God is? I told that person on the phone, oh God, you know, that's a great question. How can God hear all the prayers of everyone all the time? And my answer to her was simple, the same answer I gave earlier in the week. We need to remember who we just said we're talking about. How can God? You see, the, you're asking the question because you're putting yourself in the center of your understanding of the Almighty. You and I can barely hear ourselves think half the time. How are we going to hear everyone's prayers? Well, we're not. He's God. And that's true also for the second question. How can God forgive me when I can't forgive myself? <laughs> Take yourself out of the center and you'll start to see the answer. 
forgiveness is up to me, yeah, this becomes impossible. Because if, if someone else did to me what I've done to God, I know I couldn't forgive them. But who I'm not and who he is, who am I? Who's God? I can't forgive, but we're talking about the one who died to pay for all your sins. The one who didn't just stay up in heaven and wait for you to figure this whole thing out, for you to forgive yourself enough before he came and, and took care of it for you. No, he, he quite literally died for your sins before you committed one. That's who we're talking about. Who am I? Who is God? The challenge with both of these questions is that on our own, if left to ourselves, I don't even know if we'd ever even ask these questions. In our sinfulness, we'd probably be just satisfied with who we are as sinners and never even really think about it, just go on our path of destruction and never be none the wiser. We certainly wouldn't wonder about who God is because if left to our sinfulness, as is evidenced by the temptation of the devil in the garden, we think we're God. Yet we can't even understand ourselves most of the time. The good news of the gospel is that God has not left us to ourselves. God is the one who comes to us and hunts us down. Just like he did in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned. If it were up to them, they would have stayed hidden from God forever. Ashamed of their sin. Oh, they know who they were. They knew who they weren't. And if it were up to them, that's where it would have stopped. But scripture says God comes even after the first sin, walking in the garden to call to them, to call them to repentance so that they would know who he is, the God that forgives, the God that from the very first sin in the garden promised a seed of Eve who would do for us what we can't do for ourselves. In Genesis 17, we see God lovingly and patiently doing to Abram what he did for Adam and Eve, everyone before Abram, everyone after Abram gently bringing them into this crux, this cross of life, wrestling with these two questions. Who are you and who is he? Let's look again at verses 1 through 3 in Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. It's as if God is saying, before I say anything else, let's get one thing clear up front and just remind you in case you've forgotten who we're talking about here. Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. Now, I think there is so much there we don't have time to get into, but what I want you to point out, number one, is God leads with who he is, not who Abraham is. And in this instance, even though God says, walk before me, Abraham does the right thing. He falls on his face. And what does God say to, in response to Abraham falling on his face? In verse 4, God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. See, and you already have this picture of what Jesus is going to say, deny yourself. God says, walk before me, live rightly before me, that I may establish my covenant. And Abraham's response is, I'm on my face, I can't, nope. And God says, my covenant is with you. That covenant that comes through repentance and worship of who he is, who I'm not. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Notice the past tense. You will be, and now that I have changed your name, you are. A nation hasn't even come yet. Isaac isn't even born. But because I've said it, because I've proclaimed it over you, and I'm God Almighty, it's done. Might as well talk about it as if it's already happened. It's the same assurance we have. 
in baptism. God's spoken word declaring us to be righteous. Our sins literally washed away by the power of his word. That Paul would later say, you've already been risen from the dead in baptism. But I'm 99 years old, Abraham thought. My wife's 90. Verse 17, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 99 years old, bear, or 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. What a patient God we have, huh? Not only does Abraham laugh at the thought of God doing what he just said he's going to do, but his alternative is to offer up a son of adultery. Lord, remember how in chapter 16 I didn't listen to you at all and Sarah and I took things in our own hand and we had this child Ishmael and that created a whole bunch of trouble and I'm going to have to see him walk out. Remember that, that mess? Why don't you do that instead? Clearly, the life and salvation God was promising was not going to come about because of who Abraham was, but because of who God is, but because of his commitment, his faithfulness to his promise. That's really what God is doing in this third iteration of his promise to Abraham in giving the picture of circumcision. Abraham, it's so much not about you, I want you to literally cut yourself off and I'll put my promise in your flesh. Your hope of salvation is not in who you are, but in who he is. In his faithfulness to fulfill his promise, even when we have to admit like Abraham, it seems foolhardy to us. You ever looked outside, turned on the news, and thought to yourself, God, what, 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 where are you? Right here, my word is not wavering. Not who I am, not who you are, not who any of these people are, who he is. What a beautiful picture of the crux of life we have in circumcision. The losing of self brings the salvation of God. It's that crux that Abraham had to be brought into to start to see the promises of God that were going to be fulfilled. And it's that same crux of life that the disciples had to be brought into by Jesus for their eyes to see that promise actually being fulfilled before them. In our text for today from Matthew 16, that's what we see Jesus doing, bringing his disciples into that same crux of life that Abraham was brought into to wrestle with who he is and who I'm not. From the very beginning of Mark's gospel, the question of who this man Jesus is has been echoing louder and louder and louder all the way up until this reading from chapter 8. Beginning in Mark 1.27, when Jesus teaches in the synagogue and rebukes a demon, the crowds ask, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And then in chapter 2, Jesus walks into the city and, and heals a paralytic and says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven, get up and walk. And the Pharisees say, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who thinks they can give sin, forgive sins but God alone? And in Mark 4, verse 41, Jesus' own disciples ask the question after seeing Jesus speak to a storm and it calms everything. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And in beautiful artistry of literature, 
Mark brings this whole thing to a climax in chapter 6, verse 2, when Jesus goes home to Nazareth to those who think they know this boy better than everybody else. And then the questions just keep coming. Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by him? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Who is this guy? Jesus has been trying to answer those questions for his disciples the whole time through pretty big means. Casting demons out, even they confess him to be the son of the most high God. Feeding 5,000 people when the disciples were helpless to offer anything more than a sack lunch them screaming in terror for their lives on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus just telling it to be quiet and it's all good. They still weren't understanding and so in our text for today in Mark 8, Jesus asked them point blank, who do you say that I am? Peter, by the grace of God and the revelation of God, answers correctly. He says, you're the Christ. And he's right. But he doesn't understand what that means yet at all. And the truth is the disciples weren't going to understand who he was. And because they don't understand who he is, they never understand who they were until they would see the crux of life. Until they would see the Son of Man suffering. This is what Jesus begins to teach them in verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, there it is. Same reason Abraham laughed. Same reason he couldn't see it. It was the same reason Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him. The crux of life. Don't put yourself at the center, Peter. I know you don't think I should suffer. I know you don't want to suffer, but you're not going to see the salvation of God if you keep putting yourself here. It's not about who you are or who you're not. It's all about who he is and what he will do and has done because that's who he is, a God who keeps his word, even in the, the face of our unfaithfulness. A Lord who brings salvation, even through suffering. Peter and the other disciples couldn't see the true hope of, I will rise again on the third day. Because they were still putting themselves in the place of God. Putting themselves in the center of salvation. Rather than who God is. And what he has promised to do and has done. <coughs> Jesus said in verse 34, <coughs> If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, who I'm not. Take up his cross and follow me, who God is. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Excuse me. Time and time again throughout this passage, throughout the Bible, Jesus calls us into that crux of life. Who are you? Who you're not? Who is he? He's the God who saves us. He's the God who fulfills his promise. He's the God who walks this life faithfully for us, dies for us, rises again to bring us salvation. He invites us each day to see his mighty hand and work of salvation in the crux of life by remembering and asking those two questions and remembering their true answers. Who am I? That doesn't matter. Who is he? He is life. Amen. Let's pray.